If you're following the presidential election between Joe Biden and Donald Trump, you may have heard terms like blue shift or red mirage to describe potential shifts in the balance of voting tallies as they roll in on election night and beyond. While the blue shift phenomenon significantly predates speculation about the 2020 election, its effects are anticipated to be far more extreme this time around. In this video, I'll break down the origins and causes of the blue shift and why the blue shift is so dreaded among some political analysts. Election law expert Rick Hassan, for example, claimed that a blue shift could cause a nightmare scenario. So let's talk about that. What's so scary? Election night, 1948. Edward Murrow of CBS News signs off without delivering the election results of a close battle between Harry S. Truman and Thomas Dewey. The Chicago Daily Tribune is not so patient and goes to print with an incorrect projection of what the final results will be, allowing Truman to stage a public shaming for one of his least favorite papers. Fake news. 52 years later, on the election night of the year 2000, networks project Al Gore to win the presidency. Then, they withdraw it. Then they project George W. Bush to be the victor. In fact, the result would not come until a Supreme Court decision prevented a recount in Florida on December 12th. These stories reinforce a fact all too often forgotten in the age of TV and new media. It's a relatively recent phenomenon to have a winner declared the night of the election. These early projections were done for the first time by CBS and NBC in 1952, made possible through computer analysis of early returns. Let's turn to that miracle of the modern age, the electronic brain Univac and uh, Charles Collingwood. This is the face of a Univac. A Univac is a fabulous electronic machine which we have borrowed to help us predict this election from the basis of the early returns as they come in. Univac is going to try to predict the winner for us just as early as we can possibly get the returns in. At any rate, for the last six weeks or so, some 25 mathematicians, statisticians, and researchers, including some of the country's best mathematical brains, have been working on the problem which we've given to this electronic brain to try to solve for us tonight. News networks may announce winners, candidates may offer speeches of victory or concession, but the official election results do not actually exist until boards of elections certify them. As an Ohio State professor, Edward Foley put it, in an interview with The Atlantic, from a legal perspective, there are no results on election night, and there never have been. The only thing that has ever existed on election night are projected results that the media has helpfully provided to its audiences. This is not a joke or a trick. It's an experiment. We think it's going to work. We don't know. We hope it'll work. Professor Foley is actually the guy who discovered the blue shift back in 2013. Examining election results from 1960, he found that election night tallies often varied from the final result by hundreds or thousands of votes, favoring either party. But beginning in 2004, the shift became reliably democratic, and the shifts had become more extreme. For example, in Virginia in 2008, the shift was nearly 80,000 votes. While Foley has stated that political scientists have not pinned down the cause, one possibility would be the 2002 Help America Vote Act which increased the availability of provisional ballots. Fast forward to 2020, and a new potential cause for a blue shift has emerged, mail-in ballots. In past elections, Foley did not find that mail-in ballots in any way contribute to the blue shift. Indeed, several months ago, when I examined the possible effects of voting by mail, I identified research suggesting that the one reliable demographic trend with mail-in ballots was that older folks tend to use them far more often. As a result, I speculated that the familiarity with this method by older voters would mean its implementation would actually favor Trump. My assumptions would turn out to be totally incorrect. Oops. First, I assumed quite probably incorrectly that Trump would secure the older demographics, as Republicans have traditionally done so in the past. 
In fact, numerous polls have since shown Trump's support amongst older voters is waning, with Biden showing significant leads amongst seniors. Second, I failed to anticipate that Trump would repeatedly criticize voting by mail, associating the process with voter fraud. Third, I did not anticipate that Trump would encourage his supporters to become poll watchers, a practice several lawmakers and activists have identified as voter intimidation. And fourth, I naively failed to realize how quickly and how powerfully the partisan divide would translate to the culture of COVID precautions like lockdowns, masks, and social distancing. The final three of these points has created a situation where it is almost inevitable that Trump supporters will overwhelmingly favor voting in person, and Biden supporters will more frequently favor other means of casting a ballot. Since in-person votes are in many cases expected to be counted first, the effect of the blue shift will likely be exaggerated significantly in this election. Exactly when and how quickly different kinds of ballots are counted varies by state. Amongst critical battlegrounds, Florida, Colorado, and New Hampshire are expected to count nearly all ballots by the end of election night. But in Nevada and Pennsylvania, a large portion of the vote is expected to remain uncounted on Tuesday night. While Pennsylvania is a state that could quite possibly make or break the election, according to analysis by 538, election night results are expected to be disproportionately made up of election day votes which will probably skew Republican. Then, as absentee ballots are counted in the ensuing days, the state will probably experience a blue shift. The state may not be announcing results until November 6th or later. The state's top election official said she expects the overwhelming majority of votes will be counted by the Friday after Election Day. So even if they meet that goal, we'll likely see a particularly strong blue shift effect in what could end up being the most critical battleground state in the union. This brings us to the nightmare scenario first predicted by a data firm founded by Democratic politician and mega donor Michael Bloomberg called Hawkfish. The company, which works for pro-Biden super PACs and is thus in no way a neutral observer, projected a scenario in which Trump could hold a massive lead on election night if only 15% of the mail ballots had been counted. But as the rest of the ballots are counted, Biden ultimately wins substantially. Hawkfish dubs this scenario the Red Mirage, and anxiety over this matter is potentially disturbing to everyone. Even though such a possibility was first conceived by Democratic analysts, it's not hard to imagine how such an outcome could be disturbing for Trump voters. Back in 2016, Hillary Clinton supporters went into election night having felt overconfident for quite some time. The readers of Huffington Post, for example, had long been seeing that Clinton had an apparent 98.1% chance of winning the presidency. The shock and horror many Clinton voters experienced on election night was broadly understood, enough to be satirized by SNL. Imagine how Trump supporters might feel if the election night coverage of the mainstream media shows him being re-elected, and then as the mail absentee and provisional ballots are counted over the coming days, his lead disappears and Biden emerges victorious. That's a painful nightmare scenario for Trump supporters. But there's an even scarier one, one in which Trump subverts the democratic process to cling on to power. On one hand, it sounds like democratic paranoia, a possibility imagined by partisans suffering from Trump derangement syndrome. On the other hand, the evidence that Trump might be working towards subverting democracy must be examined. A democratic republic does not function if citizens give their elected officials the overwhelming benefit of the doubt. Boom, Superman! The whole point of electing representatives is for the people to hold their leaders accountable. Superman! Superman! Oh. Superman! And this can only be done effectively if citizens are well informed, ethical, rational, and skeptical. Such skepticism must extend to the intentions of those who seek out and hold public office. Boom, Superman! Trump has repeatedly declined questions about accepting official election results. Just looking at times Chris Wallace asked Trump about this back in 2016, during the third presidential debate, Wallace asked Trump whether he would accept the election results, and Trump responded, what I'm saying is that I will tell you at the time, I'll keep you in suspense, okay? 
Wallace asked him a similar question in his Fox News interview in July. Trump said, I have to see. Look, you, I have to see. No, I'm not going to just say yes. I'm not going to say no. During the first presidential debate for the 2020 election, Wallace asked Trump again whether he would wait until election day was independently certified before declaring victory. And Trump refused to say that he would. He's indeed stated that the upcoming election will be the most rigged election in our nation's history. We want to make sure the election is honest, and I'm not sure that it can be. I don't... I don't know that it can be. Precisely what's led to Trump's refusal to accept this election's results is his stated mistrust of voting by mail. Trump has frequently criticized voting by mail, linking the process to voter fraud. Mail-in ballots are very dangerous. There's tremendous fraud involved. You get thousands and thousands of people sitting in somebody's living room signing ballots all over the place. They throw them out if they have the name Trump on it, I guess. While indeed there have been isolated cases of postal ballot fraud, such as in the 2018 North Carolina primary, numerous studies have found the practice to be overwhelmingly safe. Here's a list of some of the related evidence assembled by the BBC. The rate of voting fraud overall in the US is between 0.00004% and 0.0009%, according to a 2017 study by Brennan Center for Justice. A Washington Post review of the 2016 election found one proven case of postal voting fraud, and a voter fraud database collated by Arizona State University between 2000 and 2012 found 491 cases of postal ballot fraud out of hundreds of millions of votes. Oregon has held postal elections since 2000 and has only reported 14 fraudulent votes attempted by mail. Now, just because examinations of past elections shows no evidence of significant mail voting fraud, that doesn't mean that potential conspirators would not seize on the vulnerability being exposed by the new expansion of the practice for this election. Except that, according to the FBI, the kind of widespread, well-coordinated effort necessary to change an election result through mail-in voter fraud has not been detected. According to FBI Director Christopher Wray, the Bureau has not seen evidence of a coordinated national voter fraud effort. Regardless of any and all assurances that voting by mail is secure, Donald Trump has done much to undermine the perceived legitimacy of the process. Beyond his words, he may also have begun to take action. His postmaster general, Louis DeJoy, for instance, made a since withdrawn attempt to decline to treat mail-in ballots as first-class mail unless some states nearly tripled the postage they paid. Changes to the operations of the USPS have also been widely reported to have slowed down the service. Service cuts, upper management restructuring, and chaotic operational changes were producing long delays. A slower roll-in of mailed ballots, of course, could potentially prolong the effect of a red mirage. Whether Trump's stated beliefs about voting fraud and voting by mail are sincere or not makes little difference to the effect. From what the president has already said, it seems reasonable to conclude that if he loses in a red mirage scenario, he will likely declare victory on election night and then refuse to concede when the final tallies are certified. Of course, if Trump were to refuse to vacate the Oval Office after certified results clearly show him losing, the proper authorities would inevitably drag him out. Such an act would certainly cause great anxiety and panic across America, and perhaps even eruptions of violence. But even from a generously paranoid perspective, such an effort would be inevitably futile. But according to Barton Gelman, writing in The Atlantic, the worst case scenario is not that Trump rejects the election outcome. The worst case is that he uses his power to prevent a decisive outcome against him. If Trump shreds all restraint, and if his Republican allies play the parts he assigns them, he could obstruct the emergence of a legally unambiguous victory for Biden in the Electoral College and then in Congress. He could prevent the formation of a consensus about whether there is any outcome at all. He could seize on that uncertainty to hold on to power. Trump's state and national legal teams are already laying the groundwork for post-election maneuvers that would circumvent the results of the vote count in battleground states. Ambiguities in the Constitution and logic bombs in the Electoral Count Act 
make it possible to extend the dispute all the way to Inauguration Day, which would bring the nation to a precipice. The Twelfth Amendment is crystal clear that the president's term in office shall end at noon on January 20th, but two men could show up to be sworn in. One of them would arrive with all the tools and power of the presidency already in hand. This would be a terrifying scenario, and it isn't entirely impossible. We will very likely see court challenges that could delay certification of the election. Trump loyalists in Congress and in state legislatures may also attempt to exploit legal ambiguities to disrupt the normal electoral process. However, I think it prudent to note that it is quite literally a conspiracy theory and a speculation upon a speculation. This nightmare scenario would be far less likely if either candidate, Biden or Trump, has a landslide victory. The effect of a red mirage would also be eliminated if a substantial majority of mail, absentee, and provisional ballots are counted in swing states on election night. At the end of the day, the clearest problem with the blue shift effect boils down to the psychology of the American people as a whole. If citizens recognize the historical precedent of the effect and understand why the effect is likely to intensify in 2020, the dangers presented by a potential red mirage are significantly reduced. Like the election itself, the acceptance of its results relies on the people. The character of these citizens has long been considered a necessary condition for America's democracy. This is demonstrated by the famous exchange noted by Dr. James McHenry at the close of the Constitutional Convention of 1787. Benjamin Franklin was apparently asked, Well, doctor, what have we got? A republic or a monarchy? His apparent response, A republic, if you can keep it. If a red mirage does test the robustness of America's democratic practices, it will once again fall upon the American people to keep it. The function of a democratic republic is to put faith in the people, and so to trust them to rise to any challenge necessary to keep the system in place should seem very natural. Whatever the case, it seems almost a certainty that the 2020 election will create challenges for American democracy. Joe Biden has warned Democrats that he fears Donald Trump will try to steal the election, and Donald Trump has warned Republicans that the Democrats will use voting by mail as a means to commit mass voting fraud. Meaning, even if things go relatively smoothly on election night and beyond, voters on both sides of the partisan divide are already facing unprecedented anxiety around the election's legitimacy. If FDR's famous quote is to be believed, then that too, fear itself, may be a very good answer to this question. Other disputes have dragged on for weeks before reaching resolution. And each time, both the victor and the vanquished have accepted the result peacefully and in a spirit of reconciliation. So let it be with us. <laughs>